Okay, so back to our motivation. Again, reflecting on the fact that all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharma datu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, so that Mahamudra meditation that you just did with uh, Dr. Roger Jackson, who's a very renowned uh, Tibetan Buddhist scholar, particularly of Mahamudra texts, that meditation, there's a less wordy and a more wordy way of doing the same practice. In the beginning, I think we do need a lot of guidance. And then as time goes by, we need fewer words to get us there. But I think it's interesting to look at the, the kind of chapters of a meditation. So the chapters of a meditation like this, the order will slightly vary. But of course, you're always starting with, why am I doing this? Let's bring it to the highest reason. I have a million reasons, but let's tap back into the highest reason, altruism, 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 right? And then all of your other incidental motivations get accomplished as a byproduct. In the beginning, sometimes setting your motivation or reviving your motivation is superficial. It's inauthentic. It's not quite genuine, but it is because it is what you believe, it's just not what is forefront necessarily in that moment. So I know even after all of these years, some of you still have resistance to the concept of adjusting your motivation or setting your motivation as if it has some sort of religious connotation. And it doesn't. It's just a mental training to re-expand and broaden your mind into something that can hold more. And, you know, as Lama Yeshi always says, make your mind an ocean. Meaning when your mind is very small about today and yourself and your tiny plans, as opposed to your giant plans, your tiny self, as opposed to your potentiality, all sorts of things worry you more. Yeah, your mind is much more easily agitated with a narrow focus. When self-cherishing is really active, you are less kind, you are less considerate, and you don't notice the impact you have on other people. It's not like a diabolical plot to hurt people. It's like carelessness. You know, so when we come back to our motivation again and again and again, it's like we're not trying to force ourselves to believe something we don't believe. We're reminding ourselves of our highest beliefs to lift out of that narrow focus. So the more times we do it, the more it becomes our default way of being. So whether it's with the four measurables, whether it's for, with refuge in bodhicitta, or whether for you as an individual, one word like peace is the thing, it's still an important practice to set your motivation. So even though it's basic, don't think of it like a preliminary to skip over. If you miss that first part, the rest of it is like, who knows what the result will be. Yeah, we have to launch it correctly. So, Roger started with, you know, classic four measurables, refuge in bodhicitta. Sometimes we do this in Tibetan 
connecting with the lineage of blessings from the practitioners who have resided in these languages. Sometimes we say it in our own language in order to connect more intellectually with the meaning. It's nice to kind of go back and forth between the two ways. It triggers different parts of the mind. And, you know, he comes back to, and most teachers come back to posture. Yeah, easy. How are you sitting? <laughs> and all of you know by now that sitting is not so easy. You know, it seems easy when you look at a yoga studio brochure and you see all the healthy 20 somethings in their beautiful yoga clothes and you think, oh yeah, sitting, easy. But you know, sitting's not easy. And so coming back to your posture is a very kind thing to do for yourself to hold the rest of the meditation. Yeah, so you're coming back to, have I tensed up? Have I, you know, gotten out of balance? Have I gotten ungrounded? And even if you haven't, coming back to your own body, it's like this is your home for your mind for now. And it's kind of like coming back to safety or it can start to feel that way. So even if it's only for 30 seconds, coming back to body awareness, checking in with it, always useful. So don't let go of those basics just because we're doing these like higher meditations. And then breath, and then, you know, he goes into different invitations to start to touch this kind of Mahamudra state, which is really taking the mind as the object of your meditation on emptiness. So that means you need to have done separate meditations on emptiness and separate meditations on the mental experience of the main mind, or at least your general impression of it before you can bring them together. Because Mahamudra is mostly single pointed. And now when it's in its finished form, it's totally single pointed. But for us, it kind of goes back and forth between analysis to remind us and get us there, and then a release of analysis and resonating in that space. And then we get distracted or we lose the object or we forget what we're doing and we need either verses or logic or some sort of reminder analytically, intellectually to get us back there. So the talking is important because for us as beginners, we lose either the idea of the mind or the idea of emptiness or the kind of minimal way that we're starting to bring the two together, it's very easy to kind of lose the thread and start to just drift. So this is a, a useful thing to really think that I go back and forth in one session between analysis and single pointedness. And what I analyze, if it's a guided meditation, I go with what I'm being guided to do. If it's not a guided meditation, I really am very strong with my self-awareness to ask, do I need to remind myself of the qualities of the mental experience? Or do I need to remind myself of the qualities of the lack of inherent existence? Yeah, which one is kind of fading from view? Which one is kind of losing strength and power in my focus? And once they feel rebalanced again, awareness of mind, awareness of emptiness, bringing them back together without analysis. Yeah, with just that single pointed flow state resonance. And it still might feel fabricated, it might not feel real or that you've got it, but just adopt the attitude that you have. Yeah, adopt the attitude that you've somehow figured it out. You're like, here's the main mind, clear and knowing. It's empty of inherent existence. I will say those words in my head, and then I will let go of those words in my head and see what happens. Yeah? So no pressure, no squeezing. Just see what analysis does to you, and then let go of analysis. It's very similar to like, if you do an analytical meditation on something more accessible, like compassion, you analyze your way into something you already understand. 
you already understood compassion before your analytical meditation on compassion. And you're walking yourself through the steps of what is it? What happens without it? What happens with it? What is my experience of it? What is the world experience of it? Et cetera, et cetera, whichever outline you're using until sometimes you evoke a sense of compassion. You feel almost as if your heart is opening or you're tuning into those times when compassion has been very visceral and real for you in everyday life. And then you release your analysis and just abide in compassion. It's the same technique, right? So it's the same technique of using analysis to get you into lack of analysis. And just like with compassion, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't seem to work, but it's still useful. You know, sometimes you'll meditate on something like compassion and your heart is just so warm and so open and so reconnected afterwards that the whole rest of the day, you're in love with humanity. And sometimes you're doing a compassion meditation and you believe the words that you're hearing, you believe the words that you're saying to yourself, you've connected to the meaning, but nothing particular is happening in terms of your feeling experience. Nothing particular seems to be going on except for, yep, I agree with that, Uh uh-huh, yep. (laughs) And those sessions are just as useful as the sessions where you're like feeling it, yeah? Because it's operating on different parts of the brain, different parts of the mind, different parts of the path. So it's like, don't have expectations of needing to feel it for it to be useful. The greatest power is with continuity and repetition. And then some days you're feeling it and some days you're not, but you're able to see the benefit of either. Yeah. So take what you already understand about accessible topics that you love, like compassion, and bring that knowledge to your understanding of how we meditate on emptiness, how we try to find the mother, and also how to find the mind. So, you know, don't lose what you already know. Okay, so we'll come back to this fourfold analysis. Um, First, just looking at verse nine. So in the text by Rolpe Dorje, he says, Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti set their instructions upon the wind and Manjushri Garba conveyed these to us by bird. So I hope to see my ever present old mother without the hardship of a prolonged search. Mainly meaning that these three great masters, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Manjushri Garba is referring to J. Rinpoche, Lama Tsongkhapa, who wrote the Lam Rim Chenmo, that these three masters have done the hard work for us. These masters have taken the teachings revealed by the Buddha and tidied them and clarified them and put them into order and experienced them from their own hearts and then explained them with such clarity that a lot of the hard work is done. All we need to do is keep coming back to what we know from them. So it's it's like they clarify these teachings and they set them upon the wind. So just, you know, really connect deeply with the lineage and the support that came from these previous masters. So now we'll read it in Hebrew. So this is the reassuring verse. This is the reconnection verse. And this is also the verse to point us to what are our instructions for recognizing the mother. He's really saying, keep coming back to Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Lama Tsongkhapa. Don't leave behind the teachings of those masters. 
So namely, the fourfold analysis. So yesterday we looked at recognizing the object to be negated just on its own. So remember that the main thing here is to find it, to find the problematic portion, to find the inherently existent self, even though you already know better, even though you already know that it doesn't exist inherently, you know also that you have an innate belief that it does. So you find it. And the way that you find it is by provoking it back into prominence through imagination and memory. So we did that yesterday, just on its own. And then we have to go into the second part of saying, all right, if it exists as vividly as strongly, as obviously, as it seems to in my everyday life, or as it seems to in those moments of drama and crisis, then it has to either be one with or different from the aggregates. So if there is an inherent me, I'm the same as my parts, or I'm different than them. This is just looking plain old logic. Yeah, just plain old logic. Is there another possibility? Is there a third option for the relationship between the self and the components? Is there a self that is different than form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness? Or is self the same as those? And you, know, you think, well, it's gotta be one, of, one or the other. I don't know which it is, I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like if the self is inherent, it's gotta be one or the other. So you think, okay, I am the aggregates. How does that feel? I am the aggregates, me and parts, identical, same. Is that possible? Does that work? And you just kind of sit with that. And you think, well, no, it really does feel like self is something extra or additional or owning. So, okay, so then is the self some additional component that is related to the aggregates, but not of them? And you, you just kind of explore that concept. So we'll just go back to the chapter from Teachings from Tibet um, because Geshe Nawang Darge explains it really clearly. And then we'll do the meditation. So he says with this second point, the inherently existent I must exist as either one with the body and mind that is identical with them or separate from them. There is no third way in which it can exist. So this is the second of the four keys or the second point in the fourfold analysis, ascertaining the logical pervasion of the two possibilities of sameness or difference. So what pervades what? We have to watch for the self-existent I, which appears to be established independently as if it were not created by the mind. If the self does not exist as it appears, we should not believe in it. Perhaps we think it's someplace else, that it will show up when we meet our guru or that it's floating around outside the window somewhere. But we need to understand that there's no third alternative. Therefore, we have to meditate on the second key with awareness that if this apparent I is neither identical with nor separate from the five aggregates of body and mind, there's no way it can exist. At this point, it becomes easy for us to understand the general character of emptiness. So he goes on to say the third essential point, the third key 
is ascertaining the absence of true sameness of the I and the five aggregates. Once we have ascertained the object of refutation by meditating on emptiness and seen how it cannot exist in a way other than as one with the five aggregates or separate from them, we concentrate on whether or not the self-existent I can exist as one with the five aggregates. If the I is the same as the aggregates, then because there are five aggregates, there must be five continuums of the I because the I is one. The five aggregates must be an indivisible whole. We therefore examine each aggregate to see if it is the same as the self. We ask, are myself and my body the same? Are myself and my feelings the same? Are myself and my discriminating awareness the same? And so forth. There are many different analytical procedures to show that the concept of the self as one with the psychophysical aggregates is wrong. I can deal with them only briefly here. For example, if the self were a permanent entity, as self-existence implies, destroying it would be impossible. Then, if the I were the same as the body, the body could never die and the corpse could never be burned because this would destroy the self. This is obviously nonsensical. Also, the mind and body would be unchanging because that is the nature of a substantial self. Furthermore, if there were a self-existent I, identical with the body and the mind, it would be one indistinguishable entity and the individual designations of my body and my mind would be incorrect. Thus, there are many different ways we can reason and meditate upon to arrive at the conclusion that reality and our habitual way of perceiving things are completely different. We are not fixed, permanent entities. And then the fourth essential point, having ascertained as above that the self and the aggregates are not a true unity, we then consider whether or not our self-existent I is different from and unrelated to the aggregates. This is the fourth key. Ascertaining the absence of any true difference between the self and the aggregates. For example, if you have a sheep, a goat, and an ox, you can find the ox by taking away the sheep and the goat. Similarly, if the eye existed separately from the body and the mind, when we eliminated the body and the mind, we would be left with a third entity to represent the eye. But when we search outside of our body, feelings, consciousness, and so forth, we come up with nothing. Generations of yogis have found that there is nothing to be found beyond the aggregates. So this is something worth looking at again and again. It makes a kind of sense intellectually, logically, but then we need to go into it, I guess, so it becomes familiar enough that we can access the experiential side of it. So we'll do the meditation now, returning to a posture that feels stable and supportive. And rebalancing yourself specifically aware of the spine as straight as it can be, the chin slightly tucked in. The tongue on the upper palate. 
the eyes gazing downward unfocused or very lightly closed. The full Vajra position if you can, but only if it doesn't hurt. The hands in the traditional way, left on the bottom, right on the top, two thumbs touching. And refresh your bodhicitta to yourself, a gentle nudge to bring it back into the forefront of your mind. And back to the breath. And staying with the breath very lightly while still decisively. And shift to analysis as you did earlier. Bring your target of your reasoning, the inherently established I, to mind by remembering or imagining an instance when you strongly believed in it. These are the words from His Holiness in how to see yourself as you really are. 
find that sense of inherently established I. either remembering or imagining an instance when you strongly believed in it. And then see if you can notice the ignorance that superimposes inherent existence and identify it. So taking that strong sense of I, the notice, the layering, the addition that ignorance puts there, making it seem inherent. Ignorance adds a sense of inherence that is not there. But notice the way it does that superimposition. put particular emphasis on contemplating the fact that if such an inherent establishment exists, the I and the mind-body complex would have to be either the same or different. If that strong, visceral me is that independent thing. Then that self and the mind-body complex are either the same as each other or different from each other. Just land on some logic. See if you feel comfortable framing it in this way.
then forcefully contemplate the absurdity of assertions of the self and mind body as either same or different. Seeing and feeling the impossibility of these assertions. First looking at oneness, I and mind body would have to be utterly and in all ways one. Does that make sense? Can it be that way? If that were the case, asserting an I would be pointless. It would be impossible to think of my body or my head or my mind if they were one and the same. When the mind and body no longer exist, the self also would not exist. Since mind and body are plural, a person's selves also would be plural. We know the mind has many components, the body has many components. So then the self, there would be many of. An arm self, an eye self, an intention self, a feeling self, all little independent continuums, or maybe identical continuums, but many of them. Just explore angles of that absurdity. Or the other way, since the I is just one, there is just one self, me, then mind and body would also be one unit. We couldn't even distinguish parts. Also absurd, exploring that.
And just as mind and body are produced and disintegrate, so it would have to be asserted that the I is inherently produced and inherently disintegrates. In this case, neither the pleasurable effects of virtuous actions nor the painful effects of non-virtuous actions would bear fruit for us. Or we would be experiencing the effects of actions we ourselves did not commit. And so we conclude that it seems quite unlikely, quite ridiculous to think that the I, self, me, is the one with or the same as the aggregates. That doesn't seem to work. So we shift to looking at the possibility that then it's different, the I different than the aggregates or separate from them. So then I and body and mind would have to be completely separate. In that case, the I would have to be findable after clearing away mind and body. Like a little naked self with no body and no mind, yet still there somehow. If the I and the aggregates were different, then the I would not have the characteristics of production, abiding, and disintegration, which is absurd. The I would absurdly have to be just a figment of the imagination or permanent. Absurdly, the I would not have any physical or mental characteristics if the I and aggregates were different. Not finding such an I firmly decide, neither I nor any person is inherently established. It 
It simply cannot be. And resolve from the depths of my heart, I should seek to get beyond this round of suffering brought on myself by misconceiving what does not inherently exist as inherently existing. May I get beyond this? As Thich Nhat Hanh would say, we are here to awaken from the illusion of our separateness. We know logically and biologically how incredibly interconnected we are. So why do we believe in this spontaneously self-created inherent I that somehow magically produced itself, somehow magically stands alone as some sort of primordial uniqueness in and of itself? And dedicate. Janchu Semchor in Poshe, Marke Panam Ke Yuachi, Ke Pan Yam Pame Pahi, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Tony Dawar in Poshe, Marke Panam Ke Yuachi, Ke Pan Yam Pame Pahi. Gone, gone to Palasho. May Bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness connect, deepen, and become actualized to their fullest extent. Relaxing your attention. Okay, so see you after afternoon tea.